So I wanted to introduce you to our very own Megan. Megan actually obtained her Bachelor of Science in Biology with a minor in Chemistry from the Boston College in 2007. She attended Boston University School of Medicine for her graduate studies in genetic counseling. Her studies piqued her interest in the impact of innovative technologies on diagnosing and connecting families with rare genetic disorders. She worked for seven years at Boston Children's Hospital, developing the institutional infrastructure for gene discovery, enhancing research collaborations, and evaluating the utility of genomic sequencing in newborns. In 2016, Megan joined Ambry as an exome reporting genetic counselor on the clinical genomics team, and she transitioned to the clinical affairs team as a senior clinical affairs research specialist just this year. Megan also maintains um, her research connections to the Boston community by serving as a voting member of the Massachusetts General Hospital IRB and as a course coordinator for the research seminar series at Boston University. We're really excited to have her here. And with that, Megan, I will hand it over to you for your presentation. Great, thank you, Shreya. And good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for spending part of your Friday with us to learn about exome sequencing. Um, in terms of disclosures, as you just heard, I am a full-time salaried employee at Ambry Genetics, and Ambry does offer Exome um, as a product. However, this presentation is focused on Exome as a technology, and is certainly not meant to highlight or advertise the merits of our product specifically. Some of the data um, I'll be presenting is from our lab, but I've also included, included published data from other labs um, when available. So today, first, we're going to just talk a little bit about exome technology and the types of resulting data files, common applications of exome sequencing, what makes exome sequencing unique as a clinical tool, and then through case examples, talk a little bit about a day in the life or more realistically, a few weeks in the life of an exome sample from the time when we receive it in the lab, the steps it goes through to the time where we um, report it out. So some of the advantages of exome sequencing is that it's a phenotypically unbiased platform, meaning that while most genetic tests are um, developed with a specific phenotype in mind, exome targets all the coding regions of the genes in the body. So the clinical indications for testing on exome can be very broad, and it can be an efficient way to test patients when an obvious targeted test is not available. So for example, if you had a patient with a very non-specific phenotype where there might be many, many genes um, that have been associated with that condition, or if you had a clinical indication in mind and a clinical diagnosis in mind for a patient, but perhaps there's no CLIA certified testing available for that gene. So really the types of um, uses of exome sequencing can really vary. Exome has also been shown to have a very high diagnostic rate, um, approximately 30% through various studies. There's increasing evidence to suggest that cost savings is available for patients, insurance companies, and the healthcare system through exome sequencing. And if you don't believe me, there are plenty of um, publications out there showing both the clinical utility and the um, cost saving effects of exome sequencing. So I think we hear a lot about um, the clinical utility of exome sequencing but maybe we don't remember the technical details of how the testing is actually performed. So I'll briefly review that with you now. So as I mentioned, exome aims to capture the protein, the protein coding regions of all 20,000 genes in the human body. This makes up about one to 2% of total DNA. And it's basically just aiming to get all the exons. So if you see over here, um, the DNA from a patient comes in through either blood or saliva or whatever the sample collected is, and is isolated and then fragmented. And the DNA fragments are coupled with a DNA adapter segment to uh, target the, co the coding regions, the exons, and then discard of the intronic regions or the non-coding regions. From there, the fragments are selected um, onto a, um, a depending on the type of platform we're using, either um, DNA or RNA bait, um, and then are sequenced in parallel many times over. And so what that sequencing looks like 
um, is multiple reads that come out that are then aligned to the reference sequence. So basically, if we look at it in another way, we have our um, full genome that comes in, it gets sheared into the pieces of interest, sequenced, and then realigned oftentimes multiple times um, because the sequence is done in parallel. And so the same uh, location is read multiple times and then aligned to the reference unit or the reference genome. And so what we see in the lab um, is the readout. This would be an example of the proband sample up top um, and then mother and father. And each read here, each blue and pink bar would be either a sequence read going forwards or reverse, and the call which was um, made at that point. So if we zoom in on this particular sequence, you can see dad and mom are both heterozygous here for a T, and the patient is homozygous. So we're about 50% of the reads on each parent is calling this as a T. The full um, sequence is calling it as a T for the proband because this individual inherited the um, alteration from both of their parents. A lot of times when we talk about exome data, you hear about quote unquote raw data files. Um, and there's a couple different types and they have different sizes and different utilities. So the largest, rawest, if you will, form of data is called FASTQ. And this is um, information about each sequence cluster. So each sequence read that comes out of the pipeline is um, assigned in a four line format, given a quality score. From there, it gets aligned to the reference genome and becomes what we call a BAM file, which stands for binary alignment map. And then from there, this can be processed into a VCF or a variant call format, which is actually the standardized text file formatted to actually represent what that call is. Is it a SNP? Is it an indel? Is it a structural or a copy number variation call? And so these top two um, are very large files. Uh, they require quite a bit of storage space and they're unlikely to be useful to most users. Whereas VCFs are the most common type of file that are used for third party reinterpretation tools. So if you are requesting the raw data from a lab, chances are, or a research um, uh, group for that matter, chances are the VCF file is the one that's gonna be the most useful for you. And if you're collecting the, the FASTQ and the BAM files, it's probably just gonna take up a lot of space um, on your servers. And labs might also offer you additional types of data files, which are further filtered. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. The other thing you hear a lot about is coverage metrics. And a lot of times people ask about what the um, total depth or the average depth of coverage is for an exome. And that's not necessarily the best way to uh, measure a quality of an exome. Specifically, you, you should ask more about the percent of the exome covered sufficiently. And I'll illustrate that here. Um, so if we had a 100X exome and each of these train cars carries, it represents a letter um, in the genetic code, and each dot here is the equivalent of one depth read of that location. You can see here at 100X, we have very good coverage of most of these nucleotides. However, this T and this A over here are below the quality threshold. So it's gonna be hard for a bioinformatics pipeline to make an accurate call for exactly what nucleotide is at that position, because unfortunately those two positions were just not read enough times to have a quality call. So maybe we would say, okay, well let's increase the average depth and then we'll be able to get that information. Well, chances are there's probably a reason why this A and this T are not being read well by um, this pipeline. There could be a couple different reasons why areas are not well covered, um, but increasing and doubling to 200X, the depth coverage in this case, still has very low coverage for both of these nucleotides. So even though we have doubled the, the average depth um, across the genome, it still didn't improve our actual ability to call in those instances. So the percent of exome covered sufficiently, which would be the same in this example between the two, is actually a better measure of quality than the average depth obtained. 
So if we think about the types of alterations that are not reliably detected on Exome, many of them are the same types of sequencing difficulties that we have on other platforms. So genes that have pseudogenes or highly homolog homologous or repeat regions, areas that are GC rich. Um, these are just gonna be very difficult to have um, the sequencing allele to and get quality information from. Additionally, because we're shearing the DNA when we get it, detection of large structural rearrangements like inversions and translocations can also be difficult to do on exome. Because while you know a, a genetic code might come in being located on chromosome four, by the time we shear it and sequence it, it gets realigned to the exome, it's gonna show up wherever the reference genome has that um, sequence lining up. Uh, triplet repeat expansions for the same reason can be very difficult to detect. Low levels of mosaicism might be filtered out as artifacts. And uh, non-coding regions that are not covered, for example, deep intronic or promoter regions, and imprinting errors or um, UPD might also be difficult. However, there, there are certainly examples of where mosaicism, some non-coding regions, and UPD have been detected on exome. Okay, so now when we think about, we've done the sequencing, we have the data, what does it look like? So data filtering can be lab dependent. Um, each pipeline might have slightly different, slight differences in the way that they um, clean and filter their data. But in general, an exome sequence should um, result in about 200,000 to 400,000 annotated variants. From there, quality filters can remove artifacts, looking at misalignments, um, poor depth reads, uh, heterozygous ratios that don't line up. So ideally, if we were seeing a call, we'd want it to be around 50% if it was a heterozygous um, call. But if it was a het ratio of about 10%, that can be more difficult to interpret. Um, and pipelines can also filter out alterations that are unlikely to be disease causing. So for example, common alterations in the population, things that we know are known polymorphisms, or it could filter them out based on the location of the alteration. So for example, labs probably have cutoffs of where into the intron, whether it's um, plus or minus two into the intron, plus or minus six, plus or minus 10, that they're actually gonna call the variants um, and have them pass their bioinformatics pipeline and move on to the next step of filtering. And then on the flip side, you can also have protection of certain alterations. So for example, known pathogenic alterations, which may be present in patient databases, at fairly high rates can be protected by a pipeline. So a good example of this would be the sickle cell mutation, which we know can be very high in certain populations. We wouldn't want to filter that out and miss that given we know it's a um, pathogenic alteration. So from here, we get about 300 variants from um, each sample. And then you can have case-based filtering as well. Um, and again, each lab might approach this a little bit differently. But this can be based on inheritance, if family members were run at the same time as the proban, and also on phenotypic overlap. So for inheritance filtering, a lot of times exome sequencing is run on family trios. And trios have actually been shown to increase the diagnostic yield compared to proban-only testing. And a typical trio that we think of consists of a proban and then both parents. Um, ideally, they are unaffected parents, that's the most beneficial for filtering out alterations. And trio analysis can help to prioritize the variants based on segregation within the family. So if you see an alteration that is de novo, or two alterations in a recessive gene that you can confirm were inherited in trans, one from each parent, then that's really gonna make your radar go off as a possible um, relevant alteration for a proban. So depending on lab policy, they might also accept family members for complementary co-segregation samples as well, which can be helpful. So for example, if there was a, a sibling in this um, family, um, the lab might accept a sample at the time of testing and then they can do additional co-segregation studies to see if that affected or unaffected sibling um, inherited or did not inherit, depending on what we expect to see, the alteration in question. Um, and then sometimes, even if the trio or additional family members were not submitted at the time of initial testing, labs will accept um, family member samples to help with variant classification after the fact as well. 
So another really important part with variant filtering is looking at good phenotypic data. So unlike most other types of genetic testing, where the product is created for a specific phenotype, um, we really need to make sure that the alterations we're reporting out for exomes have a phenotypic overlap with the patient in question. So for example, if you were ordering an epilepsy panel, we would assume that the patient you are testing has epilepsy, or at least a very good clinical reason to be ordering that panel. For genome, um, if we're not able, or sorry, for exome, if we're not able to look at the phenotypic overlap, there's a potential that you could be getting all 300 of those variants back on the report, or none, more realistically, and that really doesn't do anyone any good. So assessing the phenotypic overlap is a major step in the prioritization of variants for exome reporting. Um, and the overall result category for exome is based not only on the alteration pathogenicity, but also the clinical correlation. So you might have a pathogenic alteration in a gene that has very little um, or uncertain clinical correlation, and the resulting category might be uncertain because we can't say for sure that that pathogenic alteration is causing the disease in that patient due to um, or based on whatever phenotypes are currently reported in the literature. So when you're um, thinking about what types of information to send in, detailed clinic notes um, can be very helpful, if not essential. And um, don't just believe me, the ACMG has said the same thing. They said that they recommend that referring physicians provide detailed phenotypic information to assist the laboratory in analyzing and interpreting the results of testing. So for clinical overlap, um, there can be various methods that labs use for prioritization of variants. So they might have an, um, an automated algorithm to measure the clinical overlap between patients and uh, between a patient and then the patients that are reported in the literature. So this might be um, including pipelines that look at HBO terms that have been assigned to a patient and crossing, check, crossing that with um, the phenotype that's maybe reported in OMIM. That could be one example of an algorithm that could be run. Um, and then also manual review of the individuals on the exome team to actually assess for phenotypic overlap as well. Clinic notes that provide detailed phenotypic information um, are definitely best. So if you were to just put something like seizures as a single word on a requisition form, while that might give us enough information to run an exome, um, knowing the, the onset of seizures, the type of seizures, and uh, more information can certainly be more helpful with determining the phenotypic overlap. There can also be limitations by age. So for example, a neonate with hypotonia, who maybe was run at just a few days of age, versus that same individual who maybe at two months of age, we now know has hypotonia, seizures, and an abnormal uh, brain MRI, could potentially have two different results that get returned on exome. So um, think about that in terms of possibilities for reanalysis, and we'll talk extensively about that later. Um, and then when you do get a, a exome result back, evaluate the clinical overlap that you see. So make sure you agree with the clinical assessment. If you're a clinician ordering an exome, you know your patient a lot better than anyone who's just reading a short blurb or a clinic note about them. So if there was a, um, you know, a, a disagreement that you had, call the lab and talk to them. Um, we're all on the same team. And sometimes we actually see that targeted exams from a candidate alteration that's on a report can actually lead to better phenotyping of the patient. So if there's a, a small um, feature that maybe wasn't detected in the patient, at initial follow-up or at initial exam, but then you know that they have a pathogenic alteration in a gene, perhaps a targeted physical exam to look for that particular finding could help bump up the phenotypic overlap. Additionally, if there is a discordance between family history um, and maybe who carries a particular alteration in the gene, it might be helpful to do a more detailed family history to see if the segregation of that alteration in the family makes sense um, on further review. So what are some of the common applications for exome sequencing? So the ACMG has commented on this, and they um, recommend exome sequencing for the following indications. So if there is no single gene or panel test available, um, but the phenotype or family history strongly implicated genetic etiology, then that could be a very good indication for um, exome. 
if there are too many genes to test, so if a patient presents with a defined genetic disorder that demonstrates a high degree of heterogeneity, making exome or genome sequencing analysis of multiple genes simultaneously a more practical approach. That might be something like just very general neurodevelopmental disorder. Um, and then also if past genetic testing has been uninformative. So if a patient presents with a likely genetic disorder, but specific genetic testing available for that phenotype has failed to provide the diagnosis. That would be an example of reflex testing, where perhaps a panel was ordered um, or some other targeted testing that seemed to align with the clinical phenotype of the patient and was negative. Um, and then lastly, they also say a fetus with a likely genetic disorder in which genetic tests, specific genetic tests, including targeted sequencing, available for that phenotype have failed to arrive at a diagnosis. And so some of these clinical indications could include cases with a suspicion of a genetic etiology, but no clear clinical diagnosis. So if there are multiple clinical features, but they do not suggest a specific disorder, if it's a case with an unusual presentation, so perhaps some of the features align with one diagnosis, but then there's also multiple features that do not, um, do not fall within that diagnosis. If it's a phenotype with many associated genes, as I mentioned, or a clinical diagnosis with no targeted testing available, complex cases with no clear diagnosis, no clear clinical diagnosis, and then again, um, previous testing that was negative, or only accounts for part of a phenotype. And the detection rates by indication can also vary, and these are just some of the reported ones in the um, literature, really going anywhere from 10% up to 76%. So what makes exome unique? We've already touched on some of these points, but I'm gonna dive into some of the um, unique tools that exome can play a role in now. So because most genetic tests are created to target a specific disease, but exome is not, there are much more um, broad clinical indications for testing. Family members' samples are often submitted. So this might be a healthy parent who would not otherwise typically go um, be having genetic testing, and now we have a whole exome sequencing on them. And um, because exome captures the coding regions for all 20,000 genes, we're actually collecting data for both characterized and uncharacterized genes. So all three of these features um, lend to um, having exome have a few other additional utilities. So first is the recording of secondary findings. Um, exome can also be very helpful in detecting multiple diagnoses in a patient. Genotype of approach first can also detect phenotypic expansions in some conditions that we thought were already well clinically defined. And it can also serve as a tool for gene discovery. And Exum has a unique ability for um, to actually go back and reinterrogate data for reclassification and reanalysis. And so we'll touch on each of these now. So I think everyone on the call should be familiar with the term uh, secondary findings. But secondary findings are incidental deleterious variants unrelated to the, clinic, to the testing indication. And these can have important clinical and medical consequences. They could be used for pre-symptomatic screening, reproductive planning, carrier testing, prenatal diagnosis, or prophylactic intervention. And labs can have different policies regarding the offering and reporting of secondary results. So depending on the lab you use, you might have to opt in or opt out of certain secondary findings. They might be part of a separate report or part of the primary exome report. Um, the ACMG has a recommended list of types of, uh, of genes in which alterations should be reported. Uh, and some labs just offer that ACMG recommended list. Some labs have additional uh, secondary quote unquote panels that you could order as well. And there might be associated costs depending on the types of secondary findings that you're interested for your patient. So in 2016, there was, or 17, sorry, there was a, um, an update to the ACMG list, and it's currently uh, 59 genes that are, um, that the ACMG says should be reported by commercial labs when performing either exome or genome sequencing. So the thought is that these are well recognized with a strong link to causation, and there's availability of preventative measures and treatments for these genes. And so um, 
by having the data on them because exome or genome sequencing was performed, not reporting these back to interested parties would be um, detrimental is basically what this uh, recommendation says. And so the updated list uh, it added four genes and took away one. And the genes are sectioned into um, KP and EP, so known pathogenic and expected pathogenic categories. And so the, they actually map out for commercial labs if you um, see a known pathogenic alteration, so an alteration it, that has already been reported and established as pathogenic in the literature, in one subset of genes, they should be reported back. And then in the EP or the expected pathogenic, it might not have already been reported in the literature, but if it would be meeting pathogenic criteria, then that should also be reported back. Too far. Um, Exome also has the ability to detect multiple diagnoses. So the ability to, exam to examine all genes in an unbiased manner can be useful for detecting multiple diagnoses. So here is just um, some of the reported rates of multiple diagnoses within exome populations that are reported in the literature. This isn't exactly comparing apples to apples, though, because you are um, each lab has obviously their own reporting protocols. And some of them, some of these papers um, include um, cases where two VUSs were reported to a patient, whereas some of these papers include where it has to at least be one um, likely positive or one or positive alteration um, in addition to a VUS or another positive or likely positive. So that probably accounts for some of the differences in these ranges. Um, but it's not an insignificant amount. You know, there are certainly, if there was up to 4% of the population that has multiple diagnoses and we're just testing them on, um, you know, a panel where maybe only one of them is being determined, there's still diagnoses that are getting missed out there. And so there are two papers I wanted to highlight that actually looked at um, this question. And this first one was by Posey in 2017 out of Baylor. And they ran two types of prediction models to actually see if the rates that they were seeing um, within their exome cohort matched what um, these prediction models said. So they had 7,374 unrelated patients who had exome over a four and a half year period. Their total diagnostic rate was 28%, and 101 individuals received two or more genetic diagnoses. So that's 1.4% of their total population, or 4.9% of their positive cases. So again, pretty significant amount. Um, and they ran these two prediction models and found that the number of multiple diagnosis cases was significantly lower than predicted. So here on the black lines, um, these are the observed rates. So this first column here is the number of individuals with one um, molecular diagnosis, uh, and then two diagnoses three, and four. And so you can see the observed rates for two, three, and four um, are lower than the predicted rates. And so they suggested that this indicates that multiple diagnoses are still under-recognized and that there might be um, some sort of force or something impacting these occurring um, in an independent fashion because it doesn't appear that these pathogenic variants are arising in an independent fashion there's something that's keeping them to, um, to be lower than predicted. And one of the hypotheses they had is that this could be a synthetic lethal effect. Um, they did find that the majority or the highest amount of, um, of patients had de novo as one of the causes of their multiple diagnoses. And um, interestingly though, there was no, I thought this was interesting at least, there was no difference in the paternal age between individuals who had two de novo findings um, and individuals who um, had no de novo findings for the multiple, um, even though I know we talk about advanced paternal age as a potential risk factor for um, increased de novo occurrences. Um, another paper that looked at multiple diagnoses was Smith et al., and that was a um, paper out of AMBRI, and they found that there was a slightly higher number of organ affected, affected organ systems in patients with multiple diagnoses compared to single um, genetic diagnoses. They also found that non-trios were more likely to have multiple diagnoses. However, um, nearly half of the non-trios who had 
a um, secondary finding. The secondary finding, or the, the second finding, was a VUS. And in some cases, by doing additional family testing, uh, you could downgrade from having multiple diagnoses down to one. So again, even though non-trios were more likely to have a multiple diagnosis, that could be an artifact of the fact that um, trio analysis can just help us rule out some alterations as a whole. Um, and then families with reported consanguinity had significantly higher rates than families with no reported consanguinity. And that was actually something that was seen um, in the POSI paper as well. Um, expanding clinical phenotypes is another um, utility of exome sequencing. So exome sequencing has revealed broader phenotypes um, that were not necessarily considered as part of the original clinical spectrum. And this includes genes that have well-established gene disease associations. And the reason is traditionally testing was performed in a phenotype to genotype manner. So you saw a patient in clinic, they reminded you of a certain diagnosis, you tested for um, alterations in that gene, and you know perhaps you got a, a positive result back. If there was a patient that didn't really seem to fit that clinical um, phenotype, you might not test for that gene, and therefore you wouldn't have gotten that diagnosis. So by reversing it to a genotype and then looking at the phenotype um, process, exome sequencing can be a very useful tool for expanding phenotypes. And again, um, there are several, several um, papers out there reporting this. Exome sequencing can also be a very useful tool for gene discovery. So this chart here is from Boycott, um, like in Boycott's group, and it shows here the rate of gene discovery by quote unquote conventional sequencing technologies. So um, the way we always looked at genes before we had next generation sequencing. And you know, we definitely had some a lot of gene discovery in the early 2000s, but once next generation sequencing came about, shown here in the blue bars, it just completely um, blew up. So uh, a lot more gene discovery going on. They estimate that a new gene is characterized every two, two days. Um, and because we're actually collecting all of this information as part of exome sequencing, we can start, again, going from genotype to phenotype, we can start collecting patients that have alterations in the same gene, comparing their phenotypes and um, defining new diagnoses that way. And tools like Matchmaker can help connect clinicians and researchers, then um, an invaluable tool for gene discovery. And we've actually seen um, out of our lab that 8% of exome cases have a novel candidate finding. So not only is it um, helping define new you know, research initiatives, but it's also having a direct impact on clinical care as well. Um, and again, there are numerous um, examples out there in literature of times when exome sequencing played a role in gene discovery. Okay, and then lastly, um, one of the utilities of exome sequencing is looking at the ability for reclassification and reanalysis. So because again, we're capturing all this data, um, we have the ability to go back and reinterrogate that information with the latest gene disease relationships. So um, this can be helpful not only when there's a characterization of a new gene, but also if the known phenotype for a gene is expanded on. Um, it can be helpful to go back and, and look at what patients had alterations in that gene and if it now fits what's known about that gene disease relationship. Um, also, over time, the phenotype or family history may change. Perhaps there is a new affected sibling born. Um, or um, a patient develops a new clinical feature, that can be helpful to go back and reanalyze the data. Um, and labs might have different policies on when, how often, and pricing of reanalysis. Um, this example over here, I apologize if I um, left the reference off, but I'll make sure it's on there when we post the slides online. This is from Lou just earlier this year from the Baylor Group. It was published in the New England Journal of Medicine um, as a correspondence. And the, the purpose of the, their letter was to um, showcase a semi-automated um, algorithm they're creating to help with going back and reanalyzing clinical or um, exome data because the need is so, um, so much that, that it takes a lot of manual hours. But I just thought this um, graph was very interesting. So this is their original cohort 
that they manually went back and um, analyzed. And so this was 250 proband only cases sequenced between 2011 and 2012. And the original yield, diagnostic yield was 24.8%, but upon reclassification uh, or reanalysis in December of 2017, they nearly doubled that um, to 46.8%. So, uh, you know, five years time, twice as many patients are pretty much getting a, a positive um, result. And you can see over here for the reasons why the vast majority is due to new gene disease um, correlation. Okay. So um, I wanted to talk briefly about some of the other types of testing that are out there. Exome certainly is not the only um, large data or next generation sequencing technology. So we have lots of comprehensive and large gene panels um, that target a set number of genes with a very high sequencing depth. These usually have a, uh, they can be a very specific phenotype or a very broad phenotype, depending on the panel. And these have superior coverage compared to exome sequencing because they often use companion technologies like finger sequencing, arrays, MLPA to enhance coverage. So if there are certain areas um, or certain, uh, certain areas that are not well covered through next generation sequencing due to the caveats we've already talked about, or if there are known um, deletion and duplications that may be hard to detect using next generation sequencing, gene panels can be enhanced to account for those. Um, these are typically run at a lower cost with a faster turnaround time. And for some indications, there might be professional guidelines already in existence, which can help with reimbursement rates. Um, which makes everybody happy. <laughs> um, and then for exome sequencing, there is high sequencing depth of the protein coding region. So you have the ability to detect certain types of alterations, um, which might be limited though. So um, unlike the gene panels that can go back and enhance for many of those types of alterations, um, the exome sequencing is kind of, you know, it is what it is um, in terms of finding certain types of alterations. Um, it does include newly characterized and novel genes, so that helps with um, reanalysis and reclassification later on, which is something that a gene panel would be limited for. Um, and reimbursement rates can vary. Right now we're seeing it um, getting covered for some indications, um, but it's still a, a challenge that um, I think the, the field is facing. And then we have genome sequencing, um, which has extensive coverage of the full genome, so unlike the, the library prep that happens when an exome sample comes in the door, where we share the data and um, allele it and start sequencing it and get rid of the uh, introns, ge uh, genome sequencing sequences every um, part of the, the DNA. So it does have lower sequencing depth compared to exome, um, but it can detect more types of alterations. So for example, um, translocations or larger structural rearrangements. Um, might be detectable on genome where they would not be on exome. Um, it also includes newly characterized and novel genes, so it has the same benefit for reanalysis and reclassification that exome does. However, it does yield very large data files, um, and to date, the clinical utility um, for reimbursement is something that is, um, in, as far as I know, not really happening. So it's got poor reimbursement uh, for clinical testing at this point. Um, so there was a paper that came out, um, again, from Ambry, that looked at um, exome sequencing coverage compared to targeted um, next generation sequencing panels. So they, it was an in silico analysis. They took um, 1,500 alterations identified on panel testing, so actual patient alterations, and checked the coverage of 100 randomly selected exomes. So to see if um, those physicians were well covered on the exome uh, and therefore could have been reported out. And then 97.3% of um, those 100, uh, or sorry, 97.3% of those 1,500 alterations were detected on all 100 individuals. And then if you looked on it on a per individual call, so if you looked at each of those 100 individuals and each of those 1,500 alterations, it was 99.7% of each call um, had sufficient coverage to make that determination on exome. So in terms of coverage of most of the types of alterations we're actually reporting out on next generation panels, 
um, it's, it's not bad. It's pretty good, I would say. Okay. Um, and then this paper just came out this uh, last month um, from King's Mortgage Group at Radies Children. And he's very well known for doing ultra rapid ex or ultra rapid whole genome sequencing in the neonatal population. So taking acutely ill infants, running um, ultra rapid genomes, so sometimes with a turnaround time of a day or two, and reporting out um, and then measuring the clinical utility. And so this study, um, what he did was he um, randomized uh, acutely infant acutely ill infants to receive either rapid genome or rapid exome sequencing. And so um, 24 of the sickest um, neonates received the, the um, ultra rapid genome. So they were kind of removed from this randomization because of their critical ill status. Um, but the remaining individuals were uh, then randomized. So 94 individuals received rapid genome sequencing and 95 um, received rapid exome sequencing. And kind of surprisingly, um, the rapid genome and the rapid exome had similar diagnostic rates. So the genome 18 out of 94 um, had a positive diagnostic rate, and for exome 19 out of 95. Um, these were proban only tested, and the negatives were then reflexed to trio testing when available, um, and it actually only led to the diagnosis and uh, to a new diagnosis in one individual. That was kind of a surprise because usually we think of trio testing as having a significantly higher diagnostic rate, but that was not the case here. Um, however, they did go on to say that most proban only cases with a variant reported later had family testing, which was used for variant classification. So meaning they maybe were able to identify an alteration that had clinical overlap, but it wasn't until there was additional family testing done that they were able to arrive at the final classification for that variant. So it still definitely shows the utility of, of family testing. Um, and so I mentioned it was kind of surprising that the exome and genome groups had similar diagnostic rates because previous studies actually reported a four to seven percent increased yield um, of diagnostic rates by, by genome. However, they did show that whole genome sequencing detected significantly more um, alterations compared to, to exome. So 12% more coding domain uh, variants, 37 more variants that were thought to have a likely uh, protein function impact. Um, and one case that was diagnosed by the genome pipeline would have been missed if it, is, if it was run on exome. Um, they also showed that the time analysis, um, that the rapid genome sequencing was faster from sample receipt to the interpretation um, because there's not the library prep step that's needed for exome, but that the genome had a longer interpretation time. Okay, so just quickly, I'm gonna walk through two case examples. Um, this is the, kind of the general workflow. Um, when we think of an exome sample that comes in, it's reviewed and uh, the sample is prepped. There's a clinical review of the phenotype. Um, the DNA is prepped, sequenced, and filtered. There's analysis step, um, a gene review step, and then the final variant workup um, and report sign out. So here's a case that comes in the door. Um, all the paperwork is reviewed. Everything looks in order. We have everything we need. Um, clinical review shows that this is a five-year-old male with developmental delay, ataxia, aviflexia, and myoclonus. He had a normal brain MRI, normal microarray, um, CSF testing and testing for the CACNA1 gene, um, as well as a comprehensive epilepsy gene panel. So pretty extensive um, prior testing. And the family history is um, negative for similar, similarly affected individuals. This was a trio that we received, so we had both unaffected parents as well. So the um, sequencing goes through, we have our filtering. 35 alterations passed our quality and um, inheritance filtering of which uh, 13 were non-poly or noise alterations in characterized genes after um, manual analysis review. So one particular alteration um, was of interest. It was in the ITPR1 gene. Um, it had been reported previously in the literature, but it was also seen in the reportedly normal mother. Um, and so this meant that even though there was good clinical overlap, 
and this alteration looked like it was likely pathogenic, um, the overall report was uncertain because it didn't match the segregation in the family. So a little bit of information, the ITPR1 gene um, uh, causes two types of cerebellar, spinocerebellar ataxia. And I'm just gonna go quickly um, in the interest of time. Um, the alteration identified, as I mentioned, didn't meet criteria for likely pathogenic variants. It had been reported in the literature and to segregate with disease in multiple families. And in those reports in the literature, all unaffected family members tested negative, and all family members that tested positive had features. So as a follow-up, the clinician did a detailed exam on mom and found that she had motor and speech delays as a child. Um, she had minor coordination problems, trouble with fine motor skills, and other mild um, motor findings um, in her eyes and hands. So as a result, with this updated clinical information, the alteration was then, and the report was then upgraded to positive because it's um, now segregated with disease in the family. Um, so had panel, panel testing been done without prenatal, without parental sequencing, um, might, mom might not have been diagnosed in this particular case since it was a known alteration, um, very well categorized in the literature. Um, so another example, this again is a five-year-old boy. Uh, he has a history of developmental delay, which has since resolved, speech delay, um, mild physical and fine motor delay, failure to thrive, short stature, um, and then he had some, some physical anomalies as well, borderline microcephaly, omphalocele, a recent onset of epilepsy, oligodontia, and a normal brain MRI. And again, the family history, we had a trio and it was non-contributory other than mom was a little bit on the short side. Um, and then after exome sequencing, it revealed two de novo alterations with two distinct diagnoses that account for the patient's full phenotype um, separately. So it's unlikely given the fact that these are two very distinct phenotypes that these genes would have been present on the same gene panel. Um, so one alteration was GRIN2A, which is associated with speech disorders and epilepsy. Um, this is a truncating alteration expected to result in nonsense mediated decay, so it was classified as pathogenic. Um, and this accounted for his developmental delay, epilepsy, and abnormal EEG. And then he also had a PIT-X2 alteration, um, which was classified as likely pathogenic. And this is associated with a condition called Axenfeld-Riger syndrome. And that accounted for his um, emphalocele, oligodontia, and growth retardation. So um, again, if he had had a panel, um, it maybe would have identified this GRIN2A alteration if it was a neurodevelopmental panel. Um, but I don't know if, if this second um, finding would have been picked up if they hadn't done a, a more extensive testing like exome. And with that, I'm happy to um, take any questions with the remaining time. Thank you, Megan. Um, so just a reminder, all of you guys can put in questions in the questions pane. Um, it looks like we have a couple of questions for you, Megan. So the first question um, is around deceased patients. So let's say an exome is ordered on a deceased patient. Do labs generally um, report secondary findings on the individual? And if not, why is that the reason? It's a good question. It's probably going to depend on the lab's policies. Um, and so it would be lab, lab dependent. I can't say if, if the lab said no, what their reasonings would be. Um, I don't know if that really answers it, but it, it's possible to get secondary findings on a deceased individual, if that's what the question is. Yeah, so basically they were just wondering if that's a possibility, and, and if not, what would be some of the reasons? So that's perfect. Um, and then there's one other question. Um, so several of the papers that you cited uh, indicate the power of genetic testing in the aid of a diagnosis. Um, so given how poor the reimbursement can be for um, exome, genome, and panels, how often are these positive hits due to a single gene disorder that can be diagnosed by like a physical examination or you know thorough history and single gene analysis um, which could have better reimbursement so any commentary on that 
so so the question is um why not go to target ta targeted testing um if it's better reimbursed is that, am I and also just that? yeah and so um how you know do you have some idea of how often positive hits are due to a single gene disorder that maybe could just be diagnosed by a good physical examination history gathering and, and single gene analysis and, and maybe um, a comparison of why uh, in kind of what situations maybe you would want to do that versus doing um, exome genome and, and panels that may have poor reimbursement yeah absolutely yeah um I probably didn't uh, present the the con side of, of exome sequencing uh, because I'm obviously biasedly pro it. But um, certainly, if there is a, a very obvious clinical diagnosis in mind um, for a patient, and there's targeted testing for that particular gene or, or a small subset of those genes um, that would have good reimbursement, that is definitely um, the way to go. But for some of the more complex patients that have no obvious clinical phenotype uh, or clinical diagnosis in mind. Um, they've actually, the evidence has shown, um, not enough to convince the payers yet, but that um, instead of stepwise testing of maybe five or six, you know, single gene targeted tests, it's actually cost effective to go with a broader gene channel or exome sequencing um, instead of having multiple tiers of testing, three, four, five rounds of testing. Um, but certainly, if you know, the patient walks in and they meet clinical criteria for NF, um, start with testing for NF1. Yep, that makes perfect sense. Um, it can sometimes take years also to get a diagnosis if they go the non-exome route. So those are all good things to weigh. Um, I also, there was a, the last question was for the exome case number two that you presented. Do you know how old the biological father was? Um, one of our viewers is interested if it was advanced paternal age. Um, I don't know off the top of my head. I'd have to go back and look, but um, that was one of the the Posey um, et al. 2017 paper that looked at multiple diagnoses and found that um, de novo was the most common inheritance pattern and that dominant-dominant um, combination of, you know, the first alteration was in the dominant gene and second um, alteration with the dominant gene was the most common combination, but um, the paternal age did not make a difference in that cohort. So I think the um, it was 32 and 35 were the paternal age between having two de novo alterations and having none. Um, and I want to say even that it was 32 years, the lower age that was associated with the um, two de novo. So well, that's okay. immediately where my mind goes to. Um, I don't know if that if that was the case for that particular one. Okay, thanks for answering that. Um, those are all the questions, but if you guys have... So uh, thank you, Megan, for your awesome presentation. Um, let me just see if I can show you guys where the next presentation is going to be. Okay, so we're going to have on November 15th, our next webinar, which is going to be misattributed percentage as an unanticipated finding during clinical genomic sequencing. So definitely tune in to that. But other than that, thank you guys so much and have a good weekend.